Now, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know, Paul Conroy is a multi-award winning photojournalist. Um, he spent a very long time in Libya, and in the course of this conversation, we're going to see some of his images. Then, very famously, um, he was uh, trapped in, uh, well, he was in Syria, but he was also trapped in a building where his colleague, uh, Marie Colvin, who was a, a very garlanded war correspondent, was killed. He was trapped there for six days. Uh, he took three days to escape. He was severely wounded. As you can see now, he's gone through uh, many operations. But I asked him uh, when he is all better again, uh, will he be going back to Syria? And the answer was absolutely and completely and utterly yes. So very welcome, uh, Paul. Um, Paul, just, just picking up, before we, we talk about uh, your, your, your story of particularly what happened in Syria, I'm really interested about citizen journalism and your fears and worries about it. And will you still be in a job with citizen journalism? I personally, I think I'll always be in a job as, as long as I don't end up a wedding photographer with the, with the leg, <laughs> which is what's driving me back to Syria. But um, I don't see... A conflict between the two. I don't see why they can't live hand in hand. They all, they all, it already does live hand in hand. Um, I don't see why one should put the other out. Mm -hmm. I don't think 150 years of tried and tested methods become obsolete because communications become better. Um, in Syria, we lost communications yeah. and the world changed from going from mobile phones to this, to every... And you had to trust whoever was handing it to the next person because there was no actual there was communication. A, I mean, we went from a situation where we could pick up a phone, a Blackberry, well, to nothing. Yeah, I'm going to come on to Syria and actually the fact that communications was almost what did for you yeah. in Syria. But let's go back to Libya because you spent a long time in Libya. Sunday Times invested a lot of money in Libya. Um, and we won't show one of the most famous images, which is your Gaddafi image, yeah. um, because we're not showing that today. Uh, but let's begin with uh, the first image, and it's an incredible image. Tell me about that. This was, um, M Marie and I had been sent to Libya to Benghazi, and we got there, and within a day we thought, in reality, that the story had moved on to Misrata, which was under siege. So Marie said, Misrata, and it was like, yep, let's go. We went for two days. Um, parachuted in for two days. We ended up staying for two months where we essentially sat through the whole, whole siege of Misrata, which was um, to watch it go from, from a siege situation to, you know, to, we went with them door to door, house to house, as they pushed Gaddafi forces back out into the countryside and, and thus relieved the siege. And how did you get this photograph? This was, um, this was on Tripoli Street as the Gaddafi forces had started to... to literally run down the street as we, we advanced. This is one of the um, Libyan rebels as they pushed the Gaddafi force at about 150 metres on the left. Right. So um, I don't know how much that conveys of Misrata. It was a huge situation. That was just one image that, you know, is the push down the high street. And how quickly did you get that image out? Um, that, was, uh, that was out the, the same day. So, uh, you know, electronic media is great, satellite communications, also it can kill you. Yeah. You know, you leave a satellite on too long and... Well, that's what we're going to talk about, Syria. Um, your next image again, though, this is also Libya. This is Libya. This was um, the taking of Gaddafi's palace in Babar al-Azir. We'd spent, I think, 10 hours from the very early in the morning on the front line with the, with the rebel commanders as they pushed. Again, inch by inch, street by street, up to the palace walls. And this, this guy was actually shooting at a sniper that had taken down a lot of rebels around us. Um, and it was just the moment that he was aiming for a hole this big but a sniper was shooting through and he got it through. So that was, that was the real moment that the, that the palace started to fall. Is there greater pressure? Because that image, which is just an amazing image, an image not as good as that, but from that perspective, could have been taken on an iPhone by a citizen journalist. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, there's even know. more pressure now. Yeah, there is a lot of pressure. Um, again, I, 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 don't see where, I don't see a conflict of interest. Um, I see nothing on... They say a picture can speak a thousand words. You put a picture like that against a thousand words written by Marie Colvin, you have a very powerful yeah. package. You know, yeah. that is the... You know, the she's standard. been... The, the standard. The she, standard. She has been doing this for all her life till she was killed. Um, and it's very effective, you know, it's a professional pair. Now, now we're going to move on to, to Syria. And I mean, the Sunday Times has spent so much money on you in Libya. 
were lucky they had money to send you to Surrey. Yeah, yeah, we were getting down to begging, please send us, <laughs> you know, you must have some money. In and was that, was that as much you and Marie saying, we <coughs> want to get in there, we want to get in there fast? Um, it was, it was um, as, as Libya, as Gaddafi died and we, we, we were there, I mean, really, we knew that Libya would be moving on and, and Syria, the, the, the story in Syria was continually building. We knew that because of uh, social media. And th this was the, the first day in Syria. We literally crossed over the mountains at night. We just sneaked in, basically. They were shooting, etc. These were the first guys we were handed to. We got out of a car. Given to these guys. So you had to trust these, the FSA yeah, immediately. Yeah, they, these guys. But they were FSA. They were. Uh, the you fact mean, that we, yeah. we hoped that they were FSA. Um, so we were handed over to them. And, and really, there was no going back. The back way out was the border. Forward was to Babaramra, the town we, were, we wanted to get. Because there was a lot of, you know, undoubtedly genuine, real citizen journal and tweets footage coming out. Um, and, you know, I mean, that led the agenda. We knew what was happening in Babaramra. We wanted to go there because, as Western press, that we should be there. So it, that's where it works hand in hand. You know, we can't be everywhere. But, but the thing is that the point is on, on any revolution, they want you there too, no matter where the revolution is in the world, because it's an outside. Absolutely. Yep. Take me on to your next image now. Again, th these are the, these are more free Syrian army. These. These are the same people who are, who are protecting the activists and, the, gen and the, the citizen journalists within Syria. You know, everything hangs in Syria. You cannot move freely. If I'd gone 50 yards down the road without somebody scouting that, you know, I would be dead. It's a fact of life. You can't move. And that, that made reporting from Syria so difficult yeah. as you were completely realized. Well, I was going to say, it's not like the old-fashioned war, is it? There is no, no. model now for, no. for how these... You're never safe anywhere no, in we Syria. Used to wander around the in Balkan, we used to wander around the Balkans and go and talk to the, to the, um, the Serbs and the, the Croatians and Albania, and we would were, we were cross the, the front lines almost with ease, you know, as long as you gave them a sign you were coming across it. Now, there, there is, the, you know, there is no... I wouldn't go knocking at the gates of... Um, of Assad's forces asking for an interview or for some nice pictures. Well, let's talk about um, the attack and where you were. And I mean, this is just exactly the problem in a way with communications is what happened. Tell me, tell me why you think you were hit and at what point you thought they decided to hit you. We'd, we'd gone into Babaramra and the, the shelling was I mean, ferocious, ferocious shelling. We'd, we'd been there before. Um, now it needs to reach the new level. We're a Sunday newspaper, so it's very hard to get to sit and wait. So on a Tuesday night after a day of intense shelling, we decided let's use the Skype, let's onto CNN, onto BBC World, onto Channel 4, and actually get this out as it's happening, thinking we're all being very modern, um, which we did. I think it was about midnight that night. We finished the transmission. We finished the broadcasts. Very powerful, Marie, very, very emo emotive, brought, really brought the story to life. Um, seven o'clock the next morning, we noticed the shelling started, and we noticed it was a systematic pattern now. They were left, right, left. And they basically walked in the artillery shells till about 30 seconds before the first hit hit. I knew it was coming. Um, and then we took, I think, within the space of two minutes, about four or five Katusha rockets directly on the house. Marie was killed instantly. Um, Remy was killed instantly. A lot of people were injured. And this was, the, this was the media center. This is where all the transmissions, all of the YouTube footage, all of the tweeting was coming from. Yeah, so basically, the Syrian government forces possibly knew you were there, but they bloody well definitely knew you were there when the satellite yeah. dish was sitting up there on the roof for a number of hours. And this is the problem in a way, because BBC wanted to get their stuff out, CNN, Channel 4 News, everybody wants to get their stuff out. Yep. So the comms have to stay on the roof. Yep. So guess what? They hit you. Because you thought, in fact, that they'd said, OK, enough is enough. I think, hit them now. I think someone in, um, in Damascus actually got quite irritated. I think they were <laughs> yeah, pretty irritated. Um, I think that they called it a day. Um, I th it was worth their while in many ways to allow a certain amount of footage to come out because it would be used by both sides. Yep. One of the problems is a piece of footage we know for sure was taken by a genuine activist, citizen journalist, put on YouTube, but then the government would take it, put their own commentary on, and then you had a piece of footage 
with two different commentaries which is on the interesting thing as which well it was this. it was very difficult to decide which was the genuine footage it was thrown in and it was allowed to to trickle out to cause confusion see because this is the problem i mean the the thing is citizen journalism you know people from within a community know how to hide better than you know how to hide yeah Newspapers, broadcasting organizations are very reluctant, even when you can get visas and it's very hard, to let you into some places now because nobody is safe. I mean, a journalist should not be attacked by either side. And what we, of course, have seen in Syria is the old rules don't apply. Yeah. So in that way, never mind anything about you know, uh, technology, the old rules don't apply in those kind of attacks. So no, do you see yourself going in less and less? Um, I, I would hope not. I mean, we're, we're not the only people attacked. They, they were and they are now Absolutely. systematically picking off these citizen journalists in a campaign that is actually quite unreported. You know, these guys who are transmitting have, have been also been picked off. The, um, journalists have become targets, and, and I, I think there's, there's, there's very little way back from that now. Can I just see your final image now, please? This was, this. Um, this was a, in, in a house, it was called a field hospital, a field clinic. It was actually someone's house on a table. Um, and they would just, it was, we'd sit there and they would just have a continual stream of dead and wounded people. There was one doctor and a vet who would treat everybody. Um, they were completely overwhelmed. And this was just one of 50, 60 people brought in the day that we, we, were at, we spent at the field hospital clinic. This is where I ended up, actually. They brought me Yourself. back in and they were like, hello, Paul. And I was like, hello, sorry. And the, um, just before we finish, um, there's a funny story because it was, took you a long time to escape, three or four days. And tell me about the guy on the motorbike, thinking he was doing you a favour going faster. Well, we'd, we, we, I'd have to go through a tunnel to it's escape. So your legs mashed up. Yeah, it was a bit holy then. Um, but they, they put me on a motorbike, got me through a tunnel. And then he pulled me out of the tunnel, and, and instead of doing this, one guy thought, I'll give, it, I'll give him a piggyback. So I jumped on his back, he, well, he picked me up. But he, unfortunately, he put his hand in my leg, and I was like, ow. And he started moving it, and so I started kind of hitting him to say, put me down, you got me hand in my leg. And he thought, I'm, and go faster. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of like, no, stop, and he's gone. <laughs> till, till eventually somebody said, I think he might be telling you to put him down, which they, thankfully they put me down and he, he took his leg. So uh, Paul, leg. before we finish, how many ops? Nine. Nine, nine operations? Nine and counting. And how many more ops do they reckon? Another few, another few. Depends how well I behave. Well, you don't, because you're smoking all the time, but never mind. Um, <laughs> and so, and then uh, back in action, how quickly do you think? Uh, it should be, hopefully, early, early next year for the... Paul Conroy, we'll thank you very much indeed.